2021 Breakout Prison Writing Awards Celebration. My name is Kate Smeissner. I am the Director of Prison and Justice Writing here at PEN America. I'll tell you just a little bit about our program, who we are, the historic nature of it, and then I'll pass it to my colleagues to give just a, a little more insight until we move on to the heart of the show, what I know you're all here for. So PEN America's prison writing program has been in existence for over 40 years. It was founded on the heels of the Attica uprising with the intention and idea that writing is a legitimate form of power. And since then, we have been working in a couple of different verticals. We send a handbook for writers in prison to hundreds of writers a month, a free resource guide. We pair writers with mentors through the walls to work on their writing. And we have uh, an amazing contest, which is the culmination that you're seeing here tonight with our stand-in readers. And with that said, I'm gonna let Mary tell you a little bit more about what uh, the day-to-day -day looks like on the ground right now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Mary Conception and I am the Prison Writing Program Coordinator. I am currently our first point of contact for the majority of our mentors in our historic mentorship program, as Kate's mentioned. Uh, we have over 250 mentor pairs with 50 new pairs joining just this year as we collaborate with writers on the inside to develop their writing skills, learn about the literary industry and publish their work. Um, we also hold special themed events such as National Novel Writing Month, which we just wrapped up at the end of November, supporting over a dozen writers in four different facilities with writing a first draft of their novel. And we are also really, really proud of the second year of the Langle Rachman Mentorship Prize, which you just saw in our pre-show, uh, which went to an amazing three pairs of writers in our mentorship program, which we're really excited to feature and to continue to showcase every year. Um, I'm passing it to my colleague, Robbie, who will speak a little bit more about the things that you'll be seeing tonight. Hi, I'm Robbie Pollack. I'm the Prison Writing Program Manager, and I'm really excited about the uh, award-winning pieces, some of which you'll see today for our Prison Writing Contest. Our contest, which receives thousands of entries every year from writers all over the country in detention centers and jails and prisons. Um, this work is absolutely incredible. It's judged by our committee of dedicated volunteers who read all these works and share their thoughts and feedback with the writers. Um, it's also collected together in an anthology, which we're excited to share with the world. It's called uh, Visiting the Blues, and it's super awesome. It contains original artwork by Parsons students, artists uh, with the new school who shared their work in response to the specific pieces. Um, and through the partnership with BPL, we've co uh, collaborated to create this event for you today. And we're very, very excited at the work that BPL is doing and how we can interact with it. I hope you enjoy the show. Before we move on, I'll say just a few closing words. Uh, we have a lot of people to thank. There's a lot of hands that go into bringing this work to life. As you probably know, if you're here, maybe you don't, writers in prison are pretty siphoned off from connecting with the larger literary community. There is no internet. There's no real way to stage their work or presence the writers themselves. So we have a series of amazing artists standing in and reading on their behalf. We will send uh, photos, screenshots, your comments in the chat to our writers in prison to give them a sense of what this event really feels like. So don't be shy. Give us all your thoughts. <laughs> and very excitingly, 
uh, through Brooklyn Public Library, this work will be getting into the hands uh, directly of writers in New York state prisons and jails, as well as the show will be hopefully put on tablets for people to watch. So it's a big, big new effort. And with that, we will give a little space to Brooklyn Public Library to talk about their incredible justice initiatives. And then we welcome you. We do at that point really welcome you to watch the show. Thank you all so much. My name is Michael Carey and I'm the coordinator of justice initiatives at Brooklyn Public Library and I'd like to tell you a little about the work that we do. Um, our mission is to support uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated patrons and their families um, and our work consists of direct service so we do uh, we have a jail and prison services group that works directly uh, in city jail facilities, providing uh, traditional library services. Uh, they answer correspondence questions, uh, do books by mail, book recommendations, uh, facilitate book discussion groups inside. Uh, in addition to that, we have a program called Telestory, which is a video visitation program that connects uh, in currently incarcerated patrons with their families uh, through a, a live video feed in 12 of our branch libraries. Um, we're also responsible for supporting the library as a system in meeting the needs of the reentry population. Uh, this consists of uh, providing trainings for library staff, um, guides to the library uh, for the formerly incarcerated, uh, making connections between different, different areas of the library uh, who provide services that, that folk transitioning out of jail or prison need when they come home to their community. Uh, in addition to this, we also uh, work on a, we also provide public education programming around issues directly to do with the criminal legal system, um, but also uh, public education programming around issues of racial, social and economic justice. Uh, these take the form of Know Your Rights workshops. We've done Know Your Rights workshops on interaction with ICE agents on intera interactions with the police. Uh, we're really proud to be partnering with Penn on the launch of uh, the latest anthology. Uh, I feel like Penn and BPL, our, our missions are really closely aligned. It's been a real delight to work with them and uh, we really hope that you enjoy the program this evening. Hi, my name is Jane Matchak. I support the Justice Initiatives team here at Brooklyn Public Library. We developed a resource guide um, generated towards library services for folks coming home from incarceration back to Brooklyn. Um, that featured some of our community partners. We also have developed a zine to send inside where folks have, have given us feedback on their experiences and their environments of being incarcerated th during COVID-19. Um, we've also generated and shared a vaccine information packet um, where we took questions from incarcerated folks about the vaccination process and answered them to the best of our abilities with up-to-date and accurate information. Um, besides this, we've carried out a number of virtual programs over the past 18, 20 months. Um, we've done roundtable talks, panel discussions, Know Your Rights um, workshops, and many more. We've done cop watch trainings, um, and it wouldn't have been possible without you know, the numerous organizations that are also working on these same issues at us, as us. Uh, Penn has been one of those partners, and we're so excited to be celebrating the launch of this year's anthology, um, selecting some of the writings that you'll be hearing tonight. Are, has been an amazing process um, and so fun to get to hear and read so many voices um, of those authors incarcerated inside. Hi, I'm Erica Moroz. I work for Brooklyn Public Library's Justice Initiatives Department. We offer services to people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated in Brooklyn. Um, and we also extend support to the families who have loved ones who are incarcerated. So we also, as a team, have put together a reentry resource guide, which is a guide to the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, and it describes different uh, departments within the library that are helpful and relevant to 
the needs of someone who are, is, you know, reentering basically after having been incarcerated. So again, this outlines, um, you know, finding work, finding information about language, citizenship, technology, um, basically any information that would be helpful um, that we can plug people into. Yeah, we're also for Christmas and for the holidays and back to school, we put together care packages for the children of people who are inside. We are glad to be partnering with Penn for this program. Um, the work that Penn does um, supporting, you know, writers, artists, great thinkers who are incarcerated really aligns with our work in, uh, you know, solidarity with those who are incarcerated and also just refusing to um, cease contact with people just because they are in the deep you know, isolation of incarceration, basically. We want to basically be always creating a bridge between people who are on the inside and on the outside. And that can take shape as like, you know, our jail and prisons librarians bringing books inside or Pen America offering writing mentorship to people inside. Um, so always, trying to maintain that connection. Hi, I'm Austin Holland, author of White Hawk, Black Hawk, a um, project that uh, took a lot of time and effort, and I'd like to thank the poet Alex Trebar for helping me develop this for the submission. White Hawk, Black Hawk. I killed one boy over there in that hot and distant shadowland. Kid the same age you were the winter you went under the river ice. I didn't know the boy wasn't another military aged male when I shot him. Have trouble now recalling the details. Doc say I do the same thing with your death, that sometimes I confuse the two. Pointing to their lifeless notes, they say I can't remember which of you died in the sand, which of you in the water. There's an ache to that blankness, that dear glaucoma memory that scours like desert wind that fails to wash me clean. How old were you when you drowned? I need to remember. Sometimes you died in December and snow snuffed on the cabin windows and you were 13. Other times you were 14 and died in January, the night ice freezing shut that closed door. It couldn't have been spring. I'm sure of that. You never could have killed yourself then. It was always our mother's strongest season. Spring had just ended over there in Iraq when I spotted the boy I'd killed. Nights so hot you could taste them. My birthday was a week before and back home I could now legally drink. With my gun station's forward-looking infrared sights, I'd seen the boys scuttle east out of a low-walled village. Rakia or Sabia, I forget the name of the place. Not Alshula. I was on watch in the turret of my Bradley fighting vehicle. A diesel-driven mechanized cavalry mount. My squad, part of a regimental squadron famous mostly for getting massacred by Sioux Indians and North Vietnamese regulars, was perched on a Saddam-era overpass we called the Circle of Death, hunting IED and placers. There were no guardrails on the circle's paved clover, just the sheerness of edged smoke and blasted air. Sitting in the tank track BFE atop the raised road, I was surrounded by ever-burning trash pits. Their smoke and death and decomposition clinging to the outskirts of Baghdad like so many used condoms. Within the range of my Bradley's cannon, a 25 millimeter chain gun built by a well-known airplane manufacturer, my vision and will projected theocratically. The BFE's gun sight had two flare options, white hot and black hot. I could toggle between the two with the button on my hand station. White hot lit the boy's body heat like a ghost. Black Hawk gave a solid manly look. I switched to White Hawk, preferring the ghost. Through the fleared reticle, I tracked the boy's pale outline as he moved cautiously through the rubble, thinking that darkness and the slim luck of smoke could hide him. He was wrong, as I had been wrong, with utter completeness. My American technology found him, easily parsing his particular heat from the rest of the blasted landscape with as much effort as a cloud skirting the moon. 
I toggled the black hawk. I could have eliminated him then, legally. The civilian curfew was hours past, but I decided to give him time. Don't call it a mercy. Black to black hawk. Such things are rarely merciful or altruistic. I was simply exchanging one pain for another black hawk. It wasn't out of cruelty either. Name it compassion, if anything. I wanted, still want, that boy to turn back. But he didn't, as you didn't, White Hawk. Both of you march into your destined fates with dignity and bearing that exceeded your youths, Black Hawk. That is what my wounded brain tells me, at least. The boy crept over the berm that paralleled the pavement below, moving warily, and darted to the edge of the road. There, where the asphalt was already pocked and soft, from previous explosions, he started to dig. I smoked a cigarette and thought of you and your body we never found after you went under that ice. I lazed the distance to the boy. The computer answered with a solution. I watched the boy finish clearing the hole. He turned and scurried back to the scraggly tree line where he click, quickly unearthed a large cone-shaped object. When he staggered under his weight, I knew it was the IED he was going to plant. I figured it to be a 155 artillery round. The boy struggled with the bomb, rolling it to the edge of the road and, he, and into the hole he dug before healing it in. It disappeared from my sight. My BFB comm system chimed a warning about our pushing milk coalition convoy. Freezer trucks escorted by three up armored Humvees. They would be in our position in less than two mics. If the boy wired the IED in time, it'd blow the hell out of him. I cycled the 25 millimeter cannon. The gun came awake on its dry roll like a slumbered dragon, coiled back on itself, settling, coolant fans kicking on like hot breath, white hot. I lazed the boy again and led him a bit to the left. The Bradley's computer beeped its displeasure, insisted that I use the 240 Charlie coax machine gun instead of the 25. I slapped away the CPU's protestations with a savagely executed command override, Black Hawk. Sent seven 25 millimeter high explosive rounds thumping downrange. Thought briefly about extinguishing my cigarette on my arm. White Hawk. Sent seven more rounds, just in case. The cannon fired woke to my crew, sleeping in the back troop compartment. We all watched our video monitors slave to the gun sights as the convoy approached, Black Hawk. White Hawk, Black Hawk. We tensed re to receive incoming fire, fratricide, friendly fire, and unhappy reality in any war. White Hawk, Black Hawk. Our regiment had already lost a trooper to blue on blue contact on a previous deployment, but this time our two forces, my squad and the freezer truck security vehicles, didn't exchange fire, and the convoy barreled south, disappearing through the anciently crumbling Baghdad gates, their crews and guns seemingly unaware. I unbuttoned the hatches of my BFB, my squad unsaddling, yipping and yelling like a pack of loosed war dogs. Passing control of the 25 mic mic to my assistant gunner, I moved to follow, but hesitated. I was bound by no law or procedure to attend the battle damage assessment my soldiers were going to perform. At this juncture, no regulation governed the killer or indeed the killed. White Hawk, Black Hawk. I went with something compelling me down the exit ramp to see what I had done. Perhaps I wanted the hurt. My mind went black hot. Perhaps I needed the hurt. Back to white hot. Do not chide me, brother. I'm older than you ever were now. We found the dead boy by the moon and flashlight glint off his video camera lens. Something new there, the recording device. The insurgency paymasters had never before required proof of IED emplacement. Feral dogs, burn pit snuff puppies like our beloved Molly, loped in votive skeletal escort for us, their lambent eyes reflecting flame as if they held star rock. Somewhere in the darkness, the sound of seared fat sizzled and popped. The night smoke itched of chlorine and depleted uranium, and its smell was tumor sick tear. I looked down at the dead boy for a long time. Some of my crew couldn't force themselves turning said to the stink and blastedness of the trash pits. The boy's face lay grinning in quick, violent death. He did not look like he was sleeping. Not with his hip cracked and twisted up to his punctured neck like that. The whole of his rags burned away on one side, the flesh there naked and robbed of bones and blood. 
Suddenly, it felt like a murder of angels was gorging on my brain, white hot. In the end, we're all just an angel feed. Our father said that at the funeral to your empty casket, black hot, white hot, black hot. I think of you both now more and more, dead too young to have done the things sons need to do, leaving me the weakest, let's admit that, to the truth. And I will, own you both as I do. But don't you dare howl when I refuse to stitch the white hot darkness back together. Six weeks later, when I woke up from the blankness of the coma, the docs told me my crew died in the explosion. At the court martial, the prosecution testified that the Iraqi kid did indeed have time to arm the ID, pro ID properly and that my mercy had cost three troopers their lives. The trial took less than four hours. In a unanimous verdict, my peers, all of August rank, declared me not guilty. The next day, struggling to open my mailbox with wounded hands, I found, almost lost among the overdue phone bills and traffic summons and child support collection notices, a citation for bravery, a black box outlined with white trim, tightly hinged in a design to hold the citation's correspondent medal, arrived weeks later, empty. slip into my mind, see smoked turquoise and sterling silver spread across a red wool blanket on the square in Santa Fe, smell the corn tortillas frying, glide across Vienna Lake on a yacht in the falling rain sipping champagne punch, feel bubbles tickle the tongue, step into an arctic pool in Alaska fishing for grayling in ice water, perch on the edge of a sea cliff in Bermuda, drinking a banana daiquiri, inhaling the sweetness of passion flower. Hear the pounding waves below. Cheer, varsity blue at South Dakota State University basketball game. All relative to the paint chips at Walmart. Walking in the Shadow of the Valley of Men by Joseph Rosenberger. I walked onto Unit 2C at Snake River on December 19, 2015, with a bag full of clothes and a bedroll. I watched my movements carefully, as if the slightest misstep would violate a space whose boundaries were untold and yet drawn to serve whoever was watching against whoever passed. The room opened and seemed to be quaking beneath an enormous quietude. An air vent drained in the background and beneath that some soundless shifting concealed in the masonry works like cogs and wheels maintaining a constant vacancy about the air. Like any fulfillment of space would be eliminated. I was afraid an elbow might knock a jar some plate or dislodge a brick from its joinery and tear open a mechanical underworld pumping coal smoke and grinding iron black. All burning an orange glow like a fire unstoked and trembling. The officer turned from his desk and looked up, looked me up and down, shaking his head. He asked me who I was. I said my name and he looked at me like he'd expected someone else. He asked me who I ran with. No one, I told him. He asked me who I was a torpedo for. I looked at him and felt my stomach pulse. No one, I said. He topped the desk and clicked his tongue as if it was too early to tell. Then he leaned back in his chair and enjoyed his hands behind his head, contemplating the day room. All right, he told me, you're in G8. He pressed a button and I heard a door pop and Hess far away like some anonymous void unbending. He spun in the chair and tapped the desk again. He chewed his lip. I stood outside the cage laced around his desk holding my bag, holding my breath. I tried to rest the shaking in my knees. I tried to force color into my skin. The officer looked at me watching him like I needed his help and he raised his eyebrows. Go, he 
he said. He flicked his hand, then spun away again. I felt as though I was walking into an arena. The sun shone through the back windows and came up off the floor like dust and reflected the bottoms of my feet in the tile like my steps were being recorded in some counter world database. The lights in the ceiling seemed to be suspended and static, holding still that enormous quietude. Blue doors with black windows lined both walls, stacked onto tiers and facing in as if gathered in some calculation of the cold child before them. Within each window was a face held in the glare of the day room lights pitched against the darkness inside. I felt small. I felt like a piece of some larger scheme whose movements came by the hand of a whimsical God, as if my steps were of no, no consequence to my actual going. I felt everyone watching me from their windows and in the corner of my eye, I saw the flash of their smiles. I kept my head down at the turn of the stairs and walked down the tier watching my feet feeling sick. I heard people talking behind the door saying, look at him, look, look, look. And I picked up my step and I heard them laugh. I heard a slap, a scream. Hey kid, someone said as I walked by, hey, what are you in for? I looked at the man and he called me to him. Come here, he said, keep moving, yelled the officer. Someone called out a name that wasn't mine and wagered a bet. Someone else called back and said, no, he's mine. Another voice offered to be my friend, said he was a lot nicer than those other guys. He was told to go fuck himself and he called back, I'd rather fuck him instead. We all heard laughter from the back of a cell and then someone squealed, I wanna go home. I passed someone whose face loomed necklace in the window and he smiled. His hand came up and he pawed the glass and he told me, hello, so that his lips drew into a pucker. I walked faster. Behind me, someone was tapping, keeping some rhythm of anticipation as if the waiting alone might stop his heart. <clears throat> My cell was empty. The light hummed and blue mattresses on the bunk slabs lay with a slight shimmer of dust. The concrete and the walls were like words unspoken, some voiceless channel of thought or expression that could never quite relieve itself. I put my things down and the metal racked behind me. The latch sunk and a slow hum moved into the space. As if in some reclamation, a blue desk hung posted in the wall adjacent to the beds. The paint peeled back and exposed patches of iron worn smooth and eroded by the heels and palms of hands. The toilet rose from the floor and jutted out beneath the sink like some gagging underjaw. Down the sink were scrapes and the stainless steel shining in the light. I was fascinated by the light switch. The control I had over what could or could not be seen my reflection there in the window glass studying itself and then gone and then back. I flickered it over and over until I decided on darkness and let it fall. The light from the day room shone in like the glare of the moon and my skin in the darkness felt distant and bloodness, bloodless. I sat on the bottom mattress and waited for I don't know what. I had nothing but a blanket, clothes, and a toothbrush. In these things, I organized as if following the order of some rite, folding and unfolding each cloth, then setting them in piles and pressing them with a grave satisfaction. After this, I sat down again and looked at my shoes. I looked at my jeans, my t-shirt. Each article felt like something given back, small prizes handed down from gods to peasants, just the feeling of something against my chest, pressure around my waist, pockets to put my hands in. Eventually, I looked in the mirror. I had to straddle the toilet and lean over the sink. My hair was thick and two months grown, two months unwashed. I poked at a scar on my chin. 
where I had a pimple in solitary confinement and picked it, picked at it for a week until every day it bled and then scabbed and bled again. I wondered, would it ever go away? My face looked back at me like I had intruded on its space. It seemed to be asking me where I had been and why were we so pale? It looked like it wanted me expelled from my standing there looking at it. My hands on my cheeks looked incurious and invasive, like hands inspecting dead and naked parts. Then in the reflection behind me, the officer stepped up to the window. He tapped the glass and I faced him, feeling like he caught me in some filthy sex act. He asked me what I was doing. Nothing, I said. He said it was count time. He told me to sit on my bunk, and when I did, he marked his clipboard. Then he was gone. In the window frame, only the tear, the sails opposite, and the people in the darkness waiting for the doors to open. I'm Nate Marshall, and I'm reading the poem Court Kings and Flight Lessons by George Wilkerson. Nothing is left but the weight, the nostalgia for the weight of a living existence. George Sepphoris. Fifty or sixty of the back doors in the projects opened onto the two unwooded sides of a hidden mini park that doubled as our broken playground. Layers of gang graffiti decorated our basketball court. Our geodesic set of monkey bars was missing many of its climbing limbs. And one of our three swings was just two chains. But though bullet dented, our slide was fine. In 93, my neighborhood crew laid claim to what we saw as our inheritance. We own that part. I first got pukey drunk there, swaying on those chains and stumbled as I ran from cops into bordering woods where cops stopped, unwilling to get lost in the darkness that swallowed me. All on the same night, initiated in moonlight into our hood the day I graduated fifth grade. I was 12. That summer, we judged our basketball goals too high for us to dunk. So we shinnied up one of the poles and rocked it forward till it bent. For months, we got to be like Mike, but that goal kept bowing and kissed the concrete at our feet. That was the same year the after school program came outside to stage a strange activity. One day, a small team assembled a cage made of chicken wire, eight feet per side on our playground in a grassy area free of litter, liquor bottles, Coke can, crack pipes, wadded condoms, miscellany. Within it, they erected a gnarly grayish slab of driftwood. They draped with plastic milkweed, like some sort of fake ancient Christmas tree, and stacked some perforated brown boxes around its base. High on real weed, I sat on a squeaky swing, idly squeaking the swing and chain-smoking cigarettes I'd stolen from Food Lion. From the program's apartment poured about 20 excited elementary school kids and their mentors, who straight away opened the boxes. Suddenly, the cage bloomed with large, deep orange winged butterflies. Monarchs, even above the lecture on larvae, pupa, imagos, and long distance migrations on the scale of miracles, I could hear the hypnotic whispers of a thousand wings beating against their neighbors and chicken wire cage until they settled like tiger fur on their por perches. Following the talk, using fat tongued depressors, the mentors buttered sugar water onto bare arms and legs of eager kids, then grabbed their wrists and walked them two by two into 
the butterfly room. Perhaps smelling the sweetness of naivete and innocence, those regal creatures lit on them by the dozens, sipping at caramel and chocolate skin. Most stood there trembling with giggles, though others spread wide their arms like crucified by awe and spun in slow, silent circles. A couple even cried in terror, but still, for a few moments, they all got to wear this otherworldly cloth that I could just imagine felt soft as silk and light as the filaments God used to weave my dreams with. For hours afterward, when butterflies, cage, everything was gone, kids pranced around like juvenile court jesters, harlequined with patches of crusted sugar water glittering on their skin. I stood there smoking cigarettes and pushing children on the swings, squeaking them as high as I could while daring them to launch their bodies into open air, flapping and shouting, I am a monarch, I am a monarch, before they hit the earth, tucked, rolled, got up, and ran to the back of the line. No, it's nice over there. So it's still part of the zoo. Hmm. What? The zoo? You talking to me? This must be the north side. How the other side lives. North side? I mean... That's the hospital, right? Okay. Yes, I believe so. Forgive me, I'm, I'm new around here. Have a good day. Mother. Oh. God, God, Jesus. My bad, bro. You want one? I don't think we can smoke here. Fuck them. We can't do shit anymore. Isn't this America? You know, the other they roll up on me, sweating me about pissing behind the garbage can. At least I was behind the can. Don't they know at the zoo, the animals piss and shit wherever they damn well please. Must you swear so much? Must I swear? Must I swear? Where the fuck do you think you are? <sighs> fuck it. Next, you'll ask me to put out my cigarette. What cigarette? There is no cigarette. <sighs> fine, fine, whatever. I'll put it out. I'll buy some bitch ass snitch anyway. <sighs> ah. Happy knock? <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to be rude, but you gotta- Try harder. I'm just trying to read here. What's stopping you? I don't care. You do you. I'm busy anyway. I gotta make a call. Ah. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's up to me here. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's right. Hey. They want to know what you're reading. <laughs> it's a book of poetry. Poetry, huh? What are you, one of those bougie 112 guys? I mean, can you help me out? I don't have anything to give. Sure you do. You can talk to me, right? Sure, I guess. Let's talk. Really? Absolutely. You know, there was an accident at the zoo. One of the animals, well, he acted like an animal. Not their fault, I say. What do you expect? Animals shouldn't be caged up, right? Um, I guess not. Uh, did you ever have an animal? I had a dog growing up. Did you stick him in a cage all day? Her name was Betty and no, she was a farm dog. Oh, wow. She must have been so happy running in the fields. She wasn't perfect all the time, right? Maybe she peed in the house once or snarled at someone. But that didn't mean she deserved to be locked up, fed garbage, stopped being cared about. Right? No, of course not. And we disciplined her, teaching her right from wrong, but we'd never hurt her like that. We weren't monsters. <sighs> Wait until I find them. <laughs> Relax. Don't do it. That's the way to get through. That's my jam. Oh my god. I know, right? I'm good. You know? I, I don't even know your name. Everybody started calling me old school. I don't know why. 
You, you don't? Do you have a mirror? Hey, what was Jesus like? Did you ever fall off your dinosaur going oh, to school? Oh, you're funny. What do they call you? Cell phone. Cell phone? Yeah, you know. Cell phone. Beep, beep, beep. A cell phone. Probably because I'm always on the phone talking to my people. Ooh. See, that's them. They're probably sending me a text. I'll check it now. Okay then, well, uh, cell phone, where do you live? You know where I live. Southside? And I'm never going back. So it's pretty bad over there, huh? You don't know. You don't want to know. You want to turn your back and throw away the key. You want to forget about the poor, ugly, different animals. You're just like everybody else. So you're not going back? Are you deaf? Never. You, you want to know what happened at the zoo? Mm. You can't handle the truth! <laughs> okay, okay. But wait, first I have to tell you about the zoo's guard dog. The what? Who? It's the story of cell phone and the guard dog. This is no regular dog. This is a beast from hell. Nasty stuff. He might have been a cute puppy, aren't they all? But now he is something much different. They trained and beat all the good and decent out of him. They told him to keep all the animals out and all the animals in. The animals are dangerous, they told him. The animals will hurt you if you get too close, they warned. And he believed them. Behind their butt, he started to hate them. Once they put on that guard dog collar, he thought he was better than the other animals. He thought he was in charge. I started to have nightmares about this bitch-ass dog. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. He was really messing with my life. I had to do something. So I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I decided I had to teach him a lesson. So I figured the next time this mutt starts yapping at me, I'm gonna smack him right in the mouth. I was ready. I start drifting closer to him. Whack! I pop him right in the nose. Bird doggy! I tell him. And I run like hell. I look back and he's just sitting there in a daze, not woofing. So after that, I had to go into hiding for a while. You can't just punch a guard dog in the face without some consequences. But when I did finally see him again, he didn't woof at me. But, you know, I saw that he still woofed at others. It's like he really didn't learn the lesson. There's barkers and biters in the world, and if you're a barker, don't mess with a biter. But one day he'll get it. I promise you, he'll get it. The story of cell phone and the guard dog. The end. Well, what do you think? It could be a movie, right? Maybe Nick Cage could play me. You need help. Serious help. Like a team of Swedish doctors around the clock kind of help. <laughs> what? The dog lived? He's fine. His bitch ass is still whiffing away somewhere. I don't get it. Where is this dog or zoo you keep talking about? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> Did you even listen? No one listens to me. You know what? I'm done. I don't that care. I know. You're just like the rest of them. You don't. Care not about me or the other animals. Fuck him and fuck you. Whoa, whoa, my bad, bro. Chill. Sometimes I get myself worked up. Hey, listen. Oh, when are you in my skill? <sighs> Sometimes I forget to eat my candy or I don't cause it makes me sleepy, but all good, Alan. Promise. It doesn't matter anyway. I, I have to get going. It's time for you to find out what happened to the zoo. Please. Come on, I'm sorry. Fine, what happened? Move over. So, at the zoo, the animals are separated from each other for the most part, right? They're also separated from their families and the zookeepers, but it's a zoo, so that's the way it is. Move over. Don't you have enough room? You're not even sitting. And it's hot, hot as hell, with no AC, so it smells like straight ass flakes, and the animals are worked up now too, so it's loud as fuck with the monkeys screeching and the lions roaring. It's crazy. And the zoo capers enter the lion's cage. Scooch over, I said. What's your problem? You got a whole bench over there. Move over. Don't you want to know what happens to the zookeeper and the lion? What I want is for you not to touch me again. You mean like that? Seriously, what is wrong with you? How much time do you have? I guess at the end of the day, I'm just crazy, you stupid bastard. Man, you know what? Get up. Get off my bench. <laughs> Your bench? Don't you have enough? You have everything. Stop talking. This is what you wanted. Well, welcome to Burger King, because you're about to have it your way. 
what I want to. You don't know what I want. You don't know anything. Wait until you lose everything and ever anyone everyone ever back to you. Oh, they're not dead, but you're dead to them. Wait until no one will talk to you, no one understands you, and everyone looks at you like you're some kind of wild animal. See, I died a long time ago. They just forgot to bury me. Blah, 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 blah. Why are you still talking? Are you going to keep barking all day, little doggy, or are you going to bite? You know what? This isn't fair. You know what? <laughs> this ain't worth it. You're not worth it. <laughs> I know, Tiger. It's not like that. You take it. Then it will be fair. Oh, no, you pick that up. You pick that up and you fight me. Fight for your bench. You keep the bench. I don't care. You won. <laughs> no, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> Fight for your bench. Fight me. Fight, you worthless sack of dicks. <laughs> stop, just stop. <sighs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> I told you I was never going back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Jesus Christ Now I win You saved one animal today No No wait We can save you You dumb son of a bitch You already saved me But don't ever come back here This is my bench This is the lion's bench Guard! Help! Guard! Help me! All I might sit down with your hands over your head. Wait, what? No! Help him! It, was, it wasn't me! Wait, stop!
Growing Pains by uh, Leo Paul Cremona. Every little boy who has a father wants to believe that his dad is the smartest and the strongest person on earth. A fixer of all problems, big and small. That he is absolutely infallible. Some actually hold to this belief or some variation of it well into adulthood. I believe that a young man's uh, relationship with his father or a lack of one profoundly shapes the very core of the men we grow up to be. Many can call on their fathers for advice and life's various choices and challenges. For others whose fathers are no longer living, we may try to imagine what our father would have done if faced with a particular set of challenges and decisions. The circumstances of my childhood were different, but by no means unique. Growing up, I used to think that they were, in fact, unique and even shameful. Living in prisons, you know, for the last 16 years, I've come to realize that the circumstances in which I was raised were not unique at all. I have learned that many of the men I have shared living space with come from lives and households that would make most people recoil in shock were they to hear the heartbreakingly brutal and dire circumstances that they come from. Certainly ones that would make my own pale by comparison. My father was a heroin addict. There, I said it. I'm 38 years old, and that is only the second time that I've ever put those words on paper. I've actually never even said that sentence out loud. I've always felt that openly acknowledging it would somehow be shaming and disrespecting him, even a betrayal of him. More troubling is that I've always felt that openly acknowledging it personally shames and embarrasses me. Even though I had no fault in his addiction, it is a stigma that I have never truly gotten over. Dad's addiction predated my birth. As such, I feel that I never even knew the real him. When I was very young, I just thought he was either crazy or just angry, very angry. That anger routinely crossing over into actual destructive bits of uncontrolled, all-out rage. It wasn't until 1992, when I was just 10 years old, that I finally became aware of the actual problem. Initially, I actually thought the problem was something completely different. Growing up, I never felt safe or secure. However, by nature, I was always a very curious and inquisitive child. I was hungry for knowledge and loved reading and learning. Because of this, I managed to perform exceptionally well in both elementary and middle school. Many adults would remark how bright I was and how much potential they felt I had. However, no matter how well I did in school, I still saw myself as socially awkward and weird, poor, dirty kid who didn't really fit in anywhere. The boy who was always scared and anxious to go home at the end of the day, never knowing what I would encounter there. I developed an excruciating case of anxiety, though it would be several years until I knew what exact anxiety even was. My dad's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality was always a pink elephant in the room. Whenever we were home, he wasn't. We collectively held our breath, wondering which version of him was coming home. Or would he even make it home? Could he be hurt 
or overdosed somewhere, could have gotten himself arrested. Whenever my sisters, my mother, and I were in home, it was the same stomach-churning super anxiety. Which version of that would be waiting for us? Now, it would be inaccurate and dishonest if I were to say that there weren't a few fleeting and rare good times with the dad. I am very grateful to him for the things that I never got a chance to thank him for. From, from him, I think, I am sure I got the absolute love of different types of music and almost anything car related, hot rods in particular. To this day, I cannot see a really cool old 50s, 60s era car or truck without thinking, man, dad would love the way that looks and sounds. In 2008, I was summoned to the uh, office of prison counselor. She chatted with me about nothing in particular. For a few minutes, she kind of felt me out, likely trying to ascertain whether or not I'd be one of those guys who would be completely lose it when receiving bad news. Then she got serious and bluntly told me that my father had died. She then left me alone in her office and allowed me to make a long distance call to my aunt in California. As the phone rang, I fully expected to learn that what I'd been told was really a bad mistake and that was just fine. It wasn't, and he wasn't. He had had a heart attack and died, all alone in his little apartment. Even worse was that it took a few days for him to be discovered. He lay there alone all that time, while the rest of us were oblivious and consumed with our own lives and problems. A few days after I learned of my dad's death, I received a money order from him. He was in California, and I'm in Michigan. I can only imagine that he sent the money order on the same day that he died. Someone later would tell me that he, that was an unfinished letter to me, was found in the apartment next to a dictionary he bought so that his letters could be right. Twelve years later, I still have his later letters. Sadly, they're the only tangible things that I have that his hands touched. I recently watched an episode on, of TV's intervention, which caused many memories and feelings to flood me all at once. I felt a strong visceral tug from inside me as I watched a very young little boy try, try to enjoy his fifth birthday party amid his mother's wild and erratic drug-induced behavior. In that moment, he was me. I wanted to reach out to him and shield him from witnessing all the things that he will undoubtedly remember decades from now especially given the fact that the episode did not end with his young, mo young mother in recovery. She will continue to struggle, and her affliction will cause her to be indifferent to her, her young son's eventual discovery of what is wrong with his mom. That little boy might one day be broken, just like me. What I... <laughs> What I wouldn't give to borrow Marty McFly's DeLorean and go back to 1992 and have a long talk with that sad and anxious 10-year-old me. I would somehow magically know all the right words that that little boy needed to hear so badly. All the encouragement and advice that would serve him, me, well, during some of the darkest, hopeless days and nights. Advice that would encourage and inspire me to push past pain and use adversity as fuel. Advice that would spark some confidence and self-esteem. More importantly, advice that would possibly send me on a much different trajectory in my troubled life. 
one that would see me as a psychiatrist or a physician specializing in addiction. Something that would make a meaningful, positive impact on lives of men like my dad and children, like the one that I was in the 1980s and 90s. Something that have, that would have made my dad proud of me. This story is by Heather Jarvis, and I had the great pleasure of uh, having Heather as a student in my writing class for several years. So hello, Heather. I miss you. Frozen pancakes. The anticipation was killing me. I wanted Odessa, my seven-year-old, to wake up so bad. I had been up all night cleaning, hopped up on a Vicodin bender, snorting one after another until my nostrils were raw. Each one sped me up as if I was in a serious pursuit, only in this case, the only thing chasing me was the inevitable crash that followed. I had cleaned every inch of my spacious duplex. Everything was perfect to a T. My place had a Victorian feel to it with large windows, dark hardwood floors, and lots of nooks and crannies that you could hide in. The crisp aroma of lemon-scented cleanser dominated the air throughout my house. I tiptoed around Odessa's bedroom, quiet as a mouse, cleaning as she slept. I was careful not to wake her. I froze in place and held my breath when a toy I accidentally stepped on began to sing. I stared at the toy, cringing, trying to get it to stop. She didn't even stir. Her whole room was spotless. I even washed her play dishes. I was ahead of the game, or so I thought. This is what drew me to pain pills. I thought that they could make me a better version of myself. I could enjoy doing all the things that I would normally put off. Now, if Odessa would just wake up, our day could start. I was excited that I wasn't going to make the normal frozen mini pancakes with too much sticky syrup that only take 15 seconds in the microwave. Nope, that day I would not press snooze up until the last absolute minute. I wouldn't have to rush around in chaos and still get her to school 10 minutes late. Nope, not that day. That day, I would make my baby her favorite fluffy, cheesy scrambled eggs with greasy sausage links and buttery toast. She was amazing and smart. It didn't matter to her that life was unpredictable with me. She just wanted me and I just wanted her. She deserved that breakfast. She deserved the world. That is how I justified the pills. They made me better for her. If only I had realized that the pills were making things better in the moment, but tearing the big picture apart. As I waited for her to wake, I sat on my bed, chain smoking menthol cigarettes. My mouth was dry from repeated swallowing. I was impatiently inching through the time until I could wake her up. It was the longest half hour of my life. Finally, come on, baby, get up. I attempted to coax her. Do you want cheesy eggs? She opened her eyes, surprised that I was up and eager that morning. Yeah, her voice said a little louder than a whisper. On my way to the kitchen, I told her, okay, but when I'm done cooking, you're getting up. As the eggs were sizzling, frying in mel melted country crock, I saw her dragging ass through the hallway to the bathroom and I smiled to myself. Our morning was smooth, just how a morning before school in a perfect world should be. Heather, get the fuck up. You didn't pick Odessa up from school, my mother screamed, kicking my bed with her clunky clog. It took me a second to register what was going on. 
I couldn't think through her yelling. My head pounded. The light seemed to buzz when I opened my eyes, and then it hit me. After I had dropped Odessa off at school, I had crashed out hard. I had slept past her pickup time. I started to cry, but my mother had no pity for me, and she continued her verbal assault. She was attacking everything about me, criticizing anything she could find. The whole house smells like a big ashtray. It stinks in here. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? I'll just take her home with me, she threatened. My mother was a bitter woman. She had short feathered hair and a license plate that read, have a hardcore day. She was always there to pick up my slack and made sure that I knew that. I couldn't look at her. Intentions are what drove my addiction. I intended to be a good mom. I intended to go to college. I intended to be social and I intended to put my life back together. What I got was unpredictable antics. My daughter never knew what version of me she was going to get. I didn't follow through with anything. I was up, down, hot, cold, fire and water. The person I was and the person I wanted to be, both fighting the same war in my head that neither could win. I thought that drugs could fix my self-esteem and character faults, and they couldn't. The shame of things that I could not remember found me, even when I tried to hide from the world. I couldn't escape the ramifications of my recklessness. No matter how high I got, I couldn't be the person I wanted to be for very long. It never lasted. The mania of my addiction was like a roller coaster. It took me high and then I came speeding down and my world got flipped upside down over and over again. I'm grateful for my children's eyes throughout it all. Odessa's eyes, a perfect reflection of mine, seeing what I was trying to be. She didn't see that our electricity was shut off. She saw that we camped out and cuddled with candles. She saw that I made a flowy canopy around her bed while she slept. She was sound asleep as I rigged rainbow curtains up to the drop top ceiling with Christmas ribbon. She had no idea. She just woke up feeling like a princess. She didn't see my middle of the night shoplifting sprees. She just knew that she had everything that Monster High had to offer. She had addiction right in her face and she had no idea. She didn't see my failures. There are some things I can't distort for them. They can't see me if I'm not there. There is no way for me to explain to baby Anna why she hasn't had a mommy for almost all of her life, because my antics with heroin led me to prison. There is no way for me to stop the things that I think my mom is doing wrong raising my girls. I'm not there. I have no say. I have to watch them leave crying from the visiting hall, knowing that I can't leave with them. There is something defining about facing a life sentence. Everything you are and everything you ever wanted to be flashes through your mind. You're filled with regret one minute and hope the next. But when you finally do get a pinprick of motivation, such as a 10 year plea deal with possible early release, you believe in it. It reminds you that this isn't where it ends. It reminds you that you're not done. Heather, it took something major for God to get your attention. Face it, you wouldn't listen otherwise. A fellow prisoner said to me while attempting to console me on the night before my sentencing. I picked myself up and admitted it. I was wrong. I had been a shitty human being, but I accepted the court's challenge at redemption. I had faith in the system. But to the court, I will always be a case number a violent offender, 
they will never see past the things that I've done. Their vision of me is distorted, just not in my favor. Reentry? The Libra scale got pulled out and the courts decided that half my sentence hadn't been enough. In my first five years, I completed every possible program, the drug treatment, therapeutic community, anger and grief groups. I was involved in the church and I had glowing recommendations. I had zero infractions. I did what most inmates don't do or what a lot won't do. I rehabilitated myself. I'm the cream of the crop as far as institutional records go, and I'm proud of that. Prison doesn't see my crime, they see my progress. I wonder what it will be like when I'm released and labeled a felon. I wonder how I will feel. I've lived in honor dorms and gained respect by my actions here, but out there I'll be shoved to the bottom. I wonder if I'll ever be able to prove myself. I know I'll be coming out of prison, starting in the negative, but I intend to crawl my way out of the wreckage. Prison forced sobriety has opened my eyes to the truth. Recovery is beautiful. My failure has freed me. I'm sober, I'm messy, I'm emotional. I wear my hair in a big bun on top of my head most of the time. I cuss a little too much and I still manage to be late a lot. But my effort is enough. The person I've always been is enough. The system might be fucked, cruel, unfair, and inhuman at times, but at least for me, I made it mean something. I figure all I have to do to make my girls happy is be there, which I will be someday. My newfound meaning of life is simple. Even though life is a series of uncontrollable events, I am willing to look, fully live life sober and deal with all of the uncomfortableness that that brings. I will dare and not choose caution over risk. My curiosity will run wild in the chaos. I will enjoy solitude, but not live in it. I will challenge the idea of what society says my fate will be relentlessly until I become the person I always thought drugs would make me. When I'm released, I will never be the mother who oversleeps fucked up on drugs ever again. My children would rather have eaten frozen pancakes and been late every day to school than to have me away in prison. From here, frozen pancakes seem like a Denny's Grand Slam special. And if I close my eyes, I can almost taste it. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Woodson and I'm going to be reading No Change in Sight by David Webb. The boy stood in the door between the living and dining rooms, silently watching the old man, who was for him at nine years harder than he thought to figure. He hadn't been home a half hour and still wore his school clothes. The majority of this time had been spent spying on the old man, as quiet as a mouse, mind buzzing, trying hard to understand what it was like to be the old man. Every day, starting around eight when he went to school until well into the evening, the old man sat at the head of the dining table, listening to radio shows and smoking cigarettes. Joseph, he called out. Yes, sir. The old man began to wheeze and cough, but between breaths, he managed to say, come here. Yes, the boy said, standing next to his grandfather, close enough to smell his, his musty old man smell. Joe, he said, sounding extremely tired and so unlike he had the moment before. I want you to go to the store for me. I need some cigarettes. 
You sure you don't want a soda? The old man removed one of his hands from his head to bang the table. God damn it, boy. If you want the extra 15 cents, just ask me. I'll give it to you, he said. I don't want no goddamn soda. Now you gonna go to the store for me or not? I'm going, the boy said. Okay then, the old man said. Let me get my money, he said, lifting the hem of his sweater to get in his pocket. What's that? The old man asked after dividing the straightened bills and pushing them near the boy's face. That's a five, Ralph. It's a five. When Joseph returned, he saw that his aunt was home from work. Put your grandfather's change on the table. Joseph looked at his grandfather who said nothing and didn't even look in his direction. Then he did as he was told. Here, she said, handing him a dollar. Get me some cigarettes. When Joseph returned, he, he saw that his mom was home. Come here. Joseph passed his aunt her cigarettes and change and said, it was, I'm sorry. Joseph passed, Joseph passed his aunt her cigarettes and change and said it was in the bag when she asked for it again. Then he went to his mom and tried to hug her, but she held him off. Pull your pockets out, she told him. After he'd done so, she slapped his face and asked, where's your grandfather's money? Though it wasn't a hard slap, it was very humiliating. I gave it to him already, Joseph said, ask him. Joseph looked at his grandfather who said nothing and didn't even look in his direction. Okay, that is my dog snoring. I am so sorry. When did you give it to him? His mom asked. When I came from the store. Don't lie, Joe, the old man cut in. Joseph couldn't believe what he was hearing. He thought for sure his grandfather would stand up for him, tell his mother not to do that again. Like he had before, before like he had before for his little buddy. But the old man did nothing like that. And before long, they had all agreed that he should go back out and see if he could find it. In addition to making sure he brought his mother back a pack of cigarettes. This made something inside him laugh. He was thinking that even though he had never met a crazy person, he was certain that something was not right with his grandfather. He was sure he was not all there. When Joseph returned from the store with his mother's cigarettes, his aunt went into the kitchen telling the boy to put the cigarettes on the table and hurry upstairs. He was called down to dinner and ate alone. The call had come not long after he was sent to his room on the third floor next to his grandfather's. Where he stopped off before going into his own, where he'd moved to the old man's bed and held up a pillow that he punched repeatedly while imagining it as the old man's midsection. He went in his room and laid down and stared at the ceiling, think about, thinking about what went wrong with the missing money. The tears that burned his eyes with shame and betrayal grew cold as they rolled down into his ears. After he had eaten, Joseph was sent to his room in order not to leave it for anything. He was awoken from sleep when his cousin came in. Joseph was about to go downstairs when the old man called him. Hey, the old man repeated in a disgruntled fashion. Come over here, boy. Reach under there and get that jar. Where? What's in it? Joseph asked as he reached under the bed to retrieve the jar. Ew, he said, I ain't touching that. Boy, reach under there and pick that goddamn jar back up. You want money, don't you? Someone was climbing down the stairs. Someone was climbing the stairs. Joseph prayed it was not his mother. It was his cousin Benjamin. You don't want to get that for you, Ralph. I got it, he said, kneeling and reaching for the jar that rolled under the bed. Joseph left the room and waited on the stairs. 
He heard the old man tell his cousin to get his pants off the chair so he could give him something. Shortly afterward, Joseph saw him emerge through the light that came onto the landing from the old man's room. Boy, you a punk, Joseph said. The bigger boy laughed and said, stop playing. Joseph trailed his cousin into the, be- into the bathroom. Benjamin lifted the toilet seat, unscrewed the lid and emptied the jar. He listened as Joseph told him how many times he'd been to the store without being paid and about how they wouldn't let him back into the house without the money or cigarettes. Benjamin listened to it all without interrupting. When the boy was silent, he stared at him as if it were something more, but Joseph had finished. The older boy left it at that. He grabbed Joseph around the neck. He rubbed his head and told him, go up to bed and say goodnight to Ralph. He think you mad at him. Joseph did as he was told. He climbed the steps. He climbed the stairs and stepped inside his grandfather's room. Ralph, I love you. I love you, Grandpa, he told the old man. The old man bared his gums, his cheeks moving toward his eyes in an exaggerated manner. Come here, boy. Give your grandfather a hug. I'm getting ready to go to bed, Ralph. I see you tomorrow. Come here, boy, the old man said, raising his voice. No, the boy said, doing the same. Then they heard the slippers sliding over the steps as Joseph's mom climbed the stairs. Joseph, in a, whim- in a whisper, pleaded with his grandfather to save him from her. The woman had yet to enter, but she was already asking the boy why he refused to listen to her. When she had, the old man simply told her not to bother his little buddy. He was having a talk with the boy. Nothing had changed between them he said. Thank you. Hey, I'm Baratunde Thurston. I'm about to read The Scarlet Statute by Jeffrey L. Young. I have it here on this pad. Ew, that's dirty. That's nasty. Fuzzies. Mm. All right. The Scarlet Statute by Jeffrey L. Young, inspired by Minnesota Statute 609.34, a real law. You are standing beside your lawyer behind a glossy wood table, the defense's table. A crowd of spectators and reporters are seated behind you, a jury of your peers, two Muslim women dressed in their hijabs, several African Americans, and a few Mexican Americans, none of whom you've ever seen at your local park or grocery store, is seated to your left. At the head of the courtroom, sitting behind a raised, regal oak podium, is the judge. The judge. An African woman in her late 40s with large copper eyes, shoulder-length dreadlocks, and an unblemished Hershey's chocolate-colored face, stares down her wide nose at you. Her forehead is creased and her nose is scrunched up as if she's just caught a whiff of hot yellow piss. Seeing her expression, you wonder if your seer's clothing, cheap but neatly ironed and creased, fails to give her the impression that you are an upstanding citizen. The outfit doesn't reflect that you make decent money as a small business accountant. You're frugal. Others sometimes call you a miser. Despite taking Valium this morning and watching Fox and Friends to divert your worries of the day, you feel tension in your neck and your stomach feels like a heap of feathers were swiftly compressed in a box. You hear the judge speak in her deep, authoritative voice. You are guilty of Minnesota Statute 609.34, the judge says, which reads... When any man and unmarried woman have sexual intercourse with each other, they are guilty of fornication. You are a menace to society. You have participated in the gateway crime to prostitution and illegitimate children. You are the cause of America's problems, and you'll get what you deserve. 
You are hereby sentenced to the Minnesota Department of Corrections for one year. Bailiff, get this filth out of my sight. Your mouth hangs partly open, quickly drying out. Your eyeballs ache from barricading a torrent of tears. Your face is on fire. Your shirt is sticking to the thousands of sweat beads on your back, a cold, sticky feeling against your perspiring body. You turn your head and rub the back of your neck, looking hopelessly for someone in the crowded courtroom to save you. Sitting in the audience is your ex-best friend, who you've known since childhood. He's sitting on the prosecutor's side of the courtroom. Following the birth of your child, your best friend filed the criminal complaint that brought you to this moment. You remember when your friendship ended three years ago while seniors at Notre Dame together. He was dating someone with a criminal record. You disapproved and said, if they have a record, they must be a bad person. My standards are a little bit higher, I guess. You should raise yours. Your best friend lashed out at you and went on a tirade about how you always had an air of superiority. Now, he was snatching the opportunity to bring you down a notch. The guard firmly clutches your arms, bringing you back to this moment you so badly want to escape. You feel the cold iron handcuffs pinch your wrist. Shackles with a 12-inch link chain are placed on your ankles and force you to shuffle along as if your pants are down around your ankles and the toilet paper is out of reach. The six-foot guard with a life raft waist walks you like a dog to a jail cell. You hang your head low to avoid seeing all the heads swiveling left to right, left to right. You keep your attention on the scattered tiny black pebbles embedded in the concrete floor. The guard's heavy black boots create a hollow echo in your ears with each step he takes. You arrive at your cell. The bars are cruddy and rusted, 15 in all. You counted them. You hear the guard tell you in his gruff voice, Take off all your clothing. You stand in your cell, your new home, and disrobe. The soles of your feet are cold from standing barefoot on the grimy cement floor. You stand with your arms crossed over your chest, hugging yourself tightly. The gruff voice hits you again. Turn around, bend over, spread your cheeks, and cough. Your eyes widen. You hear the guard chuckle. And then the gruff voice gut punches you again. Get to it and let me see if you're holding any contraband. You tremble as you turn around. You send your mind to another place. You are bent over and vulnerable for just a few seconds, but you feel an eternity older. You turn around and the guard hands you your prison clothing. The three pairs of used underwear are gray and dingy brown and have been worn by thousands of strangers doing thousands of strange things in them. The three t-shirts smell like they've been sitting in a damp cardboard box placed in the corner of a moldy basement for the last year. And your jumpsuit is faded at the knees and heavily tattered around the cuffs. After you dress, the guard slams the cell bars closed. The sound reminds you of train wheels rattling over wood and iron tracks. You turn around and see that your cellmate is sleeping soundly on the top bunk bed. You walk to the toilet, four strides in all. Your bladder feels like a 50-pound sandbag filled with 100 pounds of sand. After you expel the urine you've been holding on to since court, you flush. Piss water mist ejects and gently settles on the head of the bottom bunk. Your bunk which is two feet from the toilet. Your cellmate passes gas so loudly it sounds like a semi-truck tooting its horn. A brown cockroach the size of your big toe scuttles across the cell floor. Late that night, you try to get some sleep. But everyone in the other cells are yelling back and forth and crooning lewd love songs all night. So you stay awake, staring at the bottom of the bunk above you. You think of your mother and father, both devoted Catholics, who were not in the courtroom to support you. 
You recall what your mother told you last year. She and your father didn't want you to attend service with them any longer. You have disgraced your father, she said. Your relationship with them is strained because of your child conceived and born out of wedlock, but from a union of love. Your parents have forsaken you, their only living child. Your older sister, Samantha, died from a drug overdose when she was 20. Sam, as you affectionately called her, could never do wrong in your parents' eyes. You were all blind to her alternative lifestyle. Your parents focused their hate and blame on her drug-using friends. You were only 12. You followed your parents' lead with your pain. Now here you are befuddled that with all the real criminals like drug addicts in the world, the legal system had time to prosecute and incarcerate you for something so personal, so innocent. How could this be a crime? You think over and over until you find yourself waking up the next morning. At six in the morning, you come out for breakfast. A person from the cell next to you is standing in a distant corner alone, eyes darting side to side and feet shuffling back and forth. You notice the person giggling and talking to no one in particular. Fuzzballs litter the person's unkempt hair. You make a mental note to avoid the mentally ill. You are given room temperature milk and cold rubbery eggs that have sherbet colored yolks of booger green, puke yellow, and cremation gray. You take your food back to your cell to eat. Your cellmate interrupts your meal with morning breath. So what you in for? You force the bland rubber chunks and pasty yolks down your throat and say, I got a year for fornicating. A whole friggin' year. Nobody was a victim. We were both consenting adults. And for having sex with someone I'm not married to, I've been taken from my child. I lost my damn job. I can't go back to our apartment or any other because landlords are afraid I'll fornicate on their property. Can you believe that? Hell, I can't even choose a legislator who will change the ridiculous fornicator law because now I can't freaking vote. Oh, you're on a roll now. It's all coming out. All your frustrations. You continue to unload on your cellmate while flailing your arms. Hell, even when I get out, if I decide to marry my partner and then live a fornicating free life, society will just see my record and think of me as the criminal, the felon, the fornicator for crying out loud. I'm absolutely stunned that I'd be punished for something I did in the privacy of my own home that didn't involve a victim. It's unjust to put me in prison with murderers, rapists, mentally ill, and, and, and worthless drug addicts who really deserve to be here. Whew. You take a breath. Your throat is parched and you realize you were yelling. You ask your cellmate, what are you in here for? Your cellmate stares coldly into your eyes and calmly replies, I was caught smoking weed in the privacy of my own home. No victim. No one was harmed. Now I'm wearing another person's underwear. I'm ripped from my family. I can't vote. Can't rent. I can't be a full citizen because I smoked weed. Now I'm in here with murderers, rapists, mentally ill people, and worthless fornicators. You are silent. You then softly say, sorry. You sit on your bunk, alone in your regret, shame, and enlightenment, and eat the rest of your funky eggs. That was The Scarlet Statute by Jeffrey L. Young inspired by Minnesota Statute 609.34, a real law. And I'm Baritone Day Thurston. It's been an honor to read this. Thank you. This is Nate Marshall, and I'm reading the poem Letters from Daddy 36 by Demetrius A. Buckley. Here is where I lie in solemn swears wrapped in wool blankets, always being put away for tomorrow. And then after tomorrow, here, I've been thinking of memory like a good old movie. It's the part we miss that draws us back. 
laughing into each other's shoulders because we know the ending. No, nothing will ever change just because we can fast forward to the parts familiar to our own comfort to hope a different outcome. Here, I can shuffle into a room falling over prisoners, beg for life in prayer, begging as prayer, asking, pleading for mercy, though we have to be this way because the lesson is learning how to ask under breath where the curses brush lip like taste of jelly. Prayer, ch a child line on a release date, someone on the other side of a fence when released. Here is where I pretend the lobby has you. Here is where an exit is simultaneous and my letters buried in poetry crack to where escaping took a metaphor at a time. Here is where you're two years old and I'm home and you're safe and cooing into your steps like every footfall is measured in strength. Here is when my door opens and my bunkie falls in with the room falling and now I'm falling and time is tossed like dirt in our cell and he's breathing under soil and I'm speaking about home being a perfect one with heating bottles and testing them on my wrists like a Rolex before run. Here, prayer comes too easy, but dead in the middle of him that it feels like God has walked out of a space I've made, a piss break when she knows my breakthrough will happen in my next life. So instead of telling me now, he makes you fatherless, and we know you got this like a first talent show, or not giving up your virginity to the first and second and third and so forth boy who told you he loved you, because love is most times like grandma's blue cat, curling around your ankle when you sit for a somber scratch behind the ear and then tails up to another with thinner fingers and a patience of giving back threefold. Here is when being fair is so far from being human that people love animals more because you can control them and pets don't tell us how ugly we are when we're crying. So praying again and again feels the days because being empty is too much like alone. And here is where I meet you for the first time. I love you.